four o'clock. And uh, today we have with us uh, Professor Deshpande, uh, who is uh, <coughs> a faculty at Stony Brook. Uh, he got his PhD in physics at Yale University in 1995. Uh, he did some postdoctoral research at Yale as a Sarican Fellow. And he joined the faculty at Stony Brook in 2004, and now he's a full professor since several years ago. Uh, he's an expert on QCD uh, in spin physics. Uh, uh, actually, it's a pity that John Russell is not here because uh, uh, Professor Spanish knows very well this uh, spin work that is you know, being done also here at KU. Um, and he's worked mainly uh, on experiments at Jefferson Lab and uh, RIC, uh, some experiments that we know well like Phoenix and now the new proposal next Phoenix. Uh, he's been uh, recognized uh, by the community for his work and leadership as an APS fellow and other recognitions and participation in several uh, national boards. And very recently, uh, this summer, he was named director of the uh, Electron Ion Collider Science uh, at Blue Heaven National Lab, which is uh, the project that will be announced to promote for the EIC project in the United States. Uh, and also very recently, since a, a few months ago, he was named director of the Center for Frontier and Nuclear Science that he helped uh, uh, develop, and he had support from Stony Brook, Blue Heaven, and several uh, private uh, foundations in the US. Probably he will tell us more about it. Uh, so today he's going to uh, discuss about the Electron Ion Collider project, that he's been uh, you know, one of the leaders of, of, of this, and so let's welcome Professor Despani. Thank you, Daniel, for the nice introduction. I'm delighted to see so many young people in the audience. This project is going to be probably run by some of you. Um, those who have more than 10% of their hair or turned gray will probably <laughs> be looking at the excitement that you will see in the... So, so I'm really looking at forward to, to getting uh, many of you getting involved in this uh, science. So uh, let me just tell you uh, what happened about two years ago. Uh, 2015, in the long-range planning exercise, U.S. Nuclear Science has a long-range plan that works out what we need to go after in the next 10 years. This plan, uh, this group of people meets every five or seven years and makes the plan for 10 and see if that needs to be tweaked a little bit uh, for the early times every five years. Um, that long-range plan made a recommendation that we recommend a high-energy, high-luminosity polarized electron-ion collider as the highest priority for new facility construction in the U.S. after the completion of FRIB. FRIB, as you know, is a machine that is currently being built at the University of Michigan uh, that deals with radioactive beam isotopes, and that's the machine that is being built right now. And the proposal is that after this completes, and the completion of construction is expected around 2019 or so, then EIC becomes the highest priority construction possible uh, uh, facility. Uh, along with that recommendation came theory in initiatives and detector and accelerator R&D, and s immediately money started flowing at more directly towards the R&D needed to realize such a collider in the future. Because as you will see, the parameters of the machine are way beyond what existed then or even as exists today. So there are, there's a significant R&D that needs to be accomplished in the next three to five years before we can start the construction of such a machine. But people have done enough R&D now and enough experiments that tell them that this is, uh, this is on, the, on the feasible uh, path. Five years ago, we couldn't say that. But now we can say that all the R&D issues are being tackled by the two national labs and various inputs from accelerated groups around the world. So um, the science of that electron ion collider is the main topic of my uh, talk today. It's really understanding the glue that binds us all. It's QCD at the next frontier. And I will try to explain through the talk all these things that I'm mentioning and uh, how, how we go about doing that. So why EIC? If you really wanted to uh, explain to someone in two words or a very short sentence, why are we trying to build the electron ion collider? It's really to understand the role that the gluon plays in QCD. 
In particular, we want to see what the gluon looks like. How is it in there? What, how is the distribution of gluon inside the proton or a nucleus? What do we understand about the nucleon that is not without the gluon? We can't really understand what a nucleon is without knowing what a gluon is doing. To understand the role of gluons in binding the quarks and gluons inside nucleons and nuclei is a very generalized statement of understanding the role of gluon in QCD. And I'll come back to that step by step. So in a way, we are starting with the standard model known fundamental particles and building a bridge towards understanding a nucleus. Really, we want to understand everything that we see in nature. And that's really what we see. This is the visible universe, all nuclei, and the role that the gluon plays in binding them together. So let me start with very basics to remind some of you. Uh, gluon is a carrier of strong force, what we call QCD, the quantum chromodynamics, that deals with the, the strong interactions that occur amongst these quarks. The gluon themselves are chargeless, electrically neutral, massless, and but they carry the color charge, which is unusually different than photons. Photons are chargeless in their own domain, but these carry a color, so that means that there is an interaction possible amongst gluons. They bind the quarks and gluons inside hadrons with tremendous force, we call that force strong force, and they are at the heart of many ununderstood or ill-understood phenomena such as color confinement. We don't see color in nature, free color in nature. Why do we don't see it? There are certain things that we don't know. Composition of nucleon spin, I will come back to that more detail later. We don't understand. We understand the proton spin is half for many decades now, better part of a century. And we know that the protons are made up of quarks and gluons. And we know the spin of quarks and gluons. And if I tell you, you can take as many quarks from me and as many gluons from me and try to build a proton, you won't be able to do it because we don't know how these interactions occur. To give the proton its spin half. The quark gluon plasma that has been studied at RIC and LHC in the heavy ion collisions, they play a very significant role there as well. So there are things that we don't understand about the gluon. What distinguishes QCD, color co interactions from QED, the, in, the electrodynamic interactions? That's mediated by the photon, which is chargeless, and QCD it is measured by the gluons, which have color charge. Which means that for in QCD and QED, you can have an electron or quark split and emit a photon and uh, remain an electron or a quark like that. That's a basic in the in, in diagram. The same thing could happen with a quark, uh, with a gluon. That can happen. A quark can radiate a glue. But on the right hand side are three example diagrams in which the gluons are interacting with gluon themselves. And that's the part you don't see in QED because they are chargeless. Since gluons are colored, they can interact with each other and form another gluon or make gluons. Which is the biggest difference between QCD and QED? The whole thing that is different that comes out compared to condensed matter multibody systems to a QCD multibody system is inherent in this diagram. So QCD as we know it is a holy grail of quantum field theories. It's nearly perfect theory that explains nature's strong interaction and is a fundamental quark theory of gluons and color fields. It's in rich in symmetries. People have seen various symmetries that you have probably seen in the undergrad, uh, uh, advanced undergraduate particle physics courses. There is color symmetry, which is unbroken but confined, global chiral flavor symmetry, exact for massless quarks, baryon number, axial charge conservation, scale invariance, CPT, discrete CPT symmetries. And all of them have some uh, breaking due to quantum effects. And most visible matter that you see emerges out as a result of those breaking of the symmetries that you see in the, uh, in the visible universe. Inherent in these QCDs are the deepest secrets of the relativistic quantum field theories, which I already mentioned. How does confinement come about? Asymptotic freedom, anomalies, spontaneous bre breaking of chiral symmetries, all depend on these nonlinear dynamics that comes from the multi-gluon interaction, the gluon interacting with each other and forming something unusual that you don't normally see in QED. 
And I'll come back to a very simpler version of that explanation a little bit later. So remember this nonlinear dynamics of QCD, which is critical to understand everything that we go forward. So where is that nonlinear structure of QCD uh, have fundamental consequences? Well, as I mentioned, the color confinement. Consequence of nonlinear gluon self-interaction. The self-interaction only comes because they are colored. It's a unique property of strong interactions. Strong quark-gluon interactions, confined motion of quarks and gluons. We know, we have evidence now, that the quarks and gluons have transverse motion, transverse motion inside a confined proton. We know how to look for that. We have discovered that through transversely spinning projects, uh, projectiles uh, hitting unpolarized quarks and looking at the left-right asymmetries of, of, of produced particles in the very forward region. If the quark that was initiating the production of a particle, like a pion or a kaon, was moving that way, then the kaons predominantly like to go in that direction. If that was moving in the that direction, then the kaons or pions predominantly come on the left-hand side. A very simple experiment where you look for left-right asymmetries in particle production. We have known this, but we have ignored it for many, many years because we could not fathom that we could see motion of transfer. And this is where Ralston here comes into picture. He was the one who first realized this could happen around 1984 or something like that, 84 to 87. And I think those are the original papers that started this idea. And I must be very honest, at that time, there was no explanation for this. And the whole field seems to have ignored that. Confined spatial correlations. Now we can see we have ways to look inside the proton without breaking it. So we will see how those are distributed. Quarks and gluons are distributed. So look at the proton with a filter that allows you to only look at the glue and look at the proton in that frame on that, with that filter. How does the proton look like? Those are the things that we can do. The ultra-dense color gluon fields is a universal many-body structure of ultra-dense color fields at the core of all hadrons and nuclei. This requires a little extra explanation, which I will give you a little bit more. But I want to emphasize there is another new thing that is coming on the horizon. Knowing what we know of QCD and the gluon, there is a prediction that there is something unusual that goes on at extremely high energy. It's universal. It happens in protons, and light nuclei, as well as uranium nucleus. Everywhere it should happen. We haven't seen direct evidence of it, and I'll come back to that. All expected to be under a femtoscope called the electron ion collider. So that's the, piece, the, the idea, that we will look at all these things and try to understand fundamental QCD issues. Without gluons, there would be no nucleons, no atomic nuclei, no, without, no visible world. Massless gluons and almost massless quarks, through their interactions, generate most of the mass in the nucleus. At many public lectures, the public discourse, you think about origin of mass to be Higgs boson. Higgs boson creates the mass of the quarks. In the proton, there are U and D quarks. They contribute 0.01% of the total mass of the proton. The rest of the mass is coming from the gluon field in the interactions. So if you look at the visible world, which has stable quarks, 99.99% of the visible mass comes from the glue, not the Higgs. It's essential to understand that the Higgs is essential to create the quarks. That's absolutely true. Without that, we would not have the QCD as we know it today. However, the visible mass of the universe comes from the gluon field. We know, we know that we have measured that gluons carry about 50% of the proton's momentum. So if you have a proton moving in a certain direction, although the quarks carry 0.1% of their mass, when the thing is moving, 50% of the uh, proton's momentum comes from the gluons and 50 from the quark antiquark pairs. It's been measured at HERA. There are experimenters here who have, who have seen this. Properties of hadrons are emergent phenomena. You can't really, I mean, until 20 years ago, people thought you could build a proton less knowing the quark structure. And people, models ex existed, and we think, we thought that they explained many things in electrodynamics or the structure of the proton, and we thought that was it. But when we started exploring it experimentally, all hell rose. So this emergent phenomena of using lots and lots of quarks and antiquarks and the gluon then uh, comes out to be 
uh, something that is really, really important in QCD. And examples of such are like sp spontaneous symmetry breaking and anomalies that are really intimately connected to the confinement of how these partons are in there. And then I will touch upon this a little later, is nucleon nucleons forces inside the nucleus also should have a quark gluon origin. We don't quite understand what it is. And I will try to explain what that connection is. But the experimental insight and guidance are crucial to complete our understanding of how hadrons and nuclei emerge from quarks and gluons. So that's the big picture that I will try to go. The method I'm going to use is electron scattering. Now you might say, it's color charge. Why would you use electron? Well, it's precision. There's something that happens with the electron that you can't do with hadron hadron. And I'll show you what it is. You have an electron or a muon coming through and it gets scattered and this virtual photon is exchanged with the hadronic object. That's your proton or any other hadronic object. That virtual photon is a very critical thing. By looking at the scattered energy and the scattered angle of the electron, you already know a lot about the interactions. So here is my Q squared. The momentum exchange in this deep inelastic scattering is a measure of resolution power. You see the lambda that I'm drawing here? That lambda is inversely proportional to the momentum exchange, 1 over Q. It's just Planck's constant, h bar by Q squared. So the smaller the lambda, the higher the Q, because it's h bar by Q. If you want to see inside the proton, you go, you better go to have high Q squared so that the lambda is small. If the lambda is smaller than the size of the proton, typically you will be able to enter the proton. If the Q is large, you will never see inside of the proton. That's called scattering, which is elastic. Proton doesn't, you don't go inside. So it's a simple relation. The smaller the lambda allows you to side, go inside the proton. That's why it's called deep inelastic scattering. And the momentum exchange can be simply derived from these four vectors to be E, E prime times 1 minus cosine theta prime. E is the initial energy of the electron, E prime is the final energy, and E cosine theta is given here. What I've just told you is that I know what the energy of the momentum exchange is based on how much change in the momentum happened for the electron, which is very obvious. That can be done. What is not obvious but is beautiful is this, the measure of inelasticity, y, which is a four vector combination like this, if you derive what each of them is, comes out to be e prime by e, cosine square theta e by two, and that's whole product one minus that. So, and then x, x Bjorkane, the momentum fraction in the infinite momentum frame, the momentum fraction carried by the quark that was hit by this photon inside the proton. Okay, so you have a bunch of 100 quarks, let's say, in a proton, they're moving, the proton is moving. The fractional momentum of the one of the quarks that was hit by this process is comes, comes out to be Q squared by 2 PQ, and you can derive it this way, and each one of them is only a function of E prime and theta prime. So just by knowing the initial energy of the electron, that is your probe, and the scattered energy of the electron and the angle at which it went, that determines that is determined principally by how well you design your detector. You are now getting the full picture of exactly what happened in the collision with the quark. All kinematics necessary are now calculable. That never happens in PP scattering or nucleus nucleus scattering. Because there, the combination of not knowing the distribution of quarks inside one proton and the distribution of quarks in the other proton you will never get what was the actual initial and final energy as precisely as we can do with a measurement like this. If you know this, you can measure the structure of the proton has been done traditionally at Hera for many years. And here is the cross-section, a total inter cross-section that is measurement of an F2 structure function which has quark and anti-quark momentum distributions. And then there is something else called the FL, the longitudinal structure function, that has the information about the gluon. I will not use this. This is the only equation I have in my, in, my, in my talk today. So I will not use it too much, but just to let you know, by knowing this precisely, we can get very precise measurement. In fact, the most precise measurement of F2 comes from such a measurement at Hera. And the most and the only measurement at, of FL also comes from Hera. This is what our high energy physics colleagues are using 
to make measurements beyond of, 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 of QCD that goes into your background subtraction when you look for, uh, for Higgs's or beyond a standard model. So here is the source. The uncertainty here is the key. And that's the one that has been measured very, very beautifully because of the electron proton scattering. Now you can build detectors and you can do inclusive measure, uh, measurements, events, where you only measure the scattered electron, but you can be more ambitious and make measurements of this side. You can look for hadrons or pions and kaons that tells you what flavor of the quark was. So here it tells you the kinematics, and on this side you put a Cherenkov detector and see distinguish between that, that interacting quark being a, a light quark or a heavy quark. Yes? And then, in addition, you have something called an exclusive measurement, where you not only see what remains of the target, but what pushed, got pushed out by the beam fragmentation so in that direction as well. So you reconstruct the whole event, no matter what. Of course, this is very expensive, because you have to build a four pi detector, go as close as possible to the beam pipe, and do all kinds of weird things that you need normally not do. But in the future, we need to do that. And I'll come back to that, why we have to do that. OK, so introduction to nucleon spin crisis. So here is my h bar by 2. That's my proton spin. And people thought that the proton looked like conglomeration of three quarks, UUD, of different colors. And you have spin half, a spin half, and a spin half. This is 1 half plus 1 half minus 1 half. The sum of the three spins is half. Proton spin is half. Picture is nice. If you use this model, very simplistic model, calculate the all the relativistic corrections, et cetera, et cetera, works out to be nice. However, when we did the experiment in 1989 to 1993 at CERN, we did an electron or a muon scattering experiment. Slack had the electron scattering. We had a muon scattering experiment. When we aligned them and turned over the spin and tried to estimate, come up with a contribution of the proton uh, to the, of the quark, surprisingly, we saw zero. So what the experiment told us in the first place was there was no correlation between the quark's polarization, spin direction, and the proton spin direction. A shocking result made New York Times and London Times saying that spin crisis, QCD was wrong. However, it was not wrong. What was wrong was we had very large uncertainties in the, uh, in the measurement that newspaper columnists don't know how to use. So we had 12% plus minus 18% was the proton so they said, oh, it's zero, consistent with zero, it's a crisis. Now, had it been that forever, yes, that would have been. Five years down the line, that 18% went down to 3%, and the 12% moved up to about 22%. That's still one of the best numbers we have done measurements over, over. Comes out to about 25% of the proton spin comes from the quarks. Over the last 10 years at, at, at RIC, we have made measurements of the gluon's contribution. Very similar process. Polarize the proton, collide them this way versus that way, and try to see what kind of contribution is coming from the gluons. It turns out it's about 25%. Currently, there is 100% uncertainty that that could have 25%. But still, even if we are wrong by full 100%, the total spin is falling short. Total spin of this part and this part is still 50% plus minus 30%. Where is the remaining coming from? Now we know from early ideas from people like Ralston, as well as now experiments that I mentioned to you, left-right asymmetries that we see in a single transverse polarized proton, we now know that there has to be a transverse motion. In a transverse motion in a confined object, what could it be? Just intuitively, you have a disk, a CD, and you put a coin on the edge, and you look at Look at it from the, from the level of the, of the disk, and you will see that the coin goes back and forth. That's the transverse motion we're talking about. So a projection of a circular motion onto a linear direction is a simple harmonic motion. If that is what is going on, that's what we are seeing when we see catch pions and kaons going left and right. When we catch the kaon going this way, a quark going that way, we catch it left, right, left moving, et cetera, et cetera. But that tells me that because proton is finite and there is a transverse motion, it has to have angular momentum. How do we measure that? That's something that we don't know, and that's something the electron-ion collider will do in the future. 
And now we are very encouraged that there is lattice groups that are coming along and they are now trying to have ambitious programs that with whatever constraints or no constraints, uh, connected diagrams and not connected diagrams, they're really marching towards getting to calculate the proton spin on the lattice, <coughs> knowing individual contributions. They think that about 10 years from now, they will be ready for an experimental comparison. And the project that we're talking about is about 10 years away. So that's good timing. Now, I want to ask you a few questions. Gedanken experiment. What does a proton look like? On the left-hand side, I have three co cartoons of static bag models called a classic MIT bag model, those of you who have taken particle physics, where there are quarks inside a sort of bound box or, or bag of energy that confine it. And here is something called the, uh, and then so let's, let's go this way, you know, static bag model. That's the, basically the proton is, is stationary. What happens if I boost it? If I boost it and I look at it with a higher resolution probe, the higher the resolution, the, the deeper the structures I start seeing. So here is now my boosted proton. The gluon field distribution is wider than, and if I am able to distinguish between the charge radius, which is defined by the quarks inside the proton, and the color radius that comes from the gluonic object, in this case, if I were to look at the proton transversely, I would imagine, I would come up with the result that the gluon's radius is larger than the charge of the quark radius. In difference to the next model that I'm saying, constituent quark model, where the gluons and C quarks inside hide behind massive quarks here like that. And if I do this, no matter what resolution I look at, there is a quark, there's a glue around it. So I can start increasing the radius, but they're all coming out to be the same. So in this experiment, I would find a gluon radius and the charge quark radius is almost the same. And lattice usually tells me that, in fact, it is not that way. They, they, they are slow moving quarks, and the gluons are more concentrated inside the quark, binding them together like that. And if I look at that with high resolution, I'm going to create a picture like that, in which the gluon average radius is going to be smaller than the quark radius. So for a transverse proton, if I really start looking at it separately as a quark, object and the gluon object, then you can start seeing these, these differences. However, to do this, we need to, need to identify these transverse images of the proton with the quarks in mind and the gluons in mind. Separate them. What do we have? Well, we only have, oh, surprise me, okay. Uh, we only have this one dimensional object. This is the X distribution of various partons. These are the valence quarks. These are the gluon distributions, much higher these are measurements from Hera, and you can see only one dimensional information is known. I can't see, this is going in the direction of the pro proton. That's, that's what I'm projecting out. X is the momentum fraction in the direction of the motion. I, I don't know how a proton looks like in the transverse direction. I've ignored it because I never needed it so far. Feynman told, told us it was okay to do that because all the kinematics and fun was in the, the, the dominant angle. Transverse was not important. <coughs> On the right hand side is the same thing, but the polarized parton distribution functions. We really need that. We really need to go beyond the one dimension to see that proton in two dimensions. And let me just give you a more realistic, more real scenario. What does the proton look like when you increase its energy? What happens to the proton from stationary to an accelerated proton? What if you were to see such a thing, transverse distance, a transverse proton, as it accelerates? There is a parton core, yes, there's a parton core, and as it gets increasingly surrounded by a meson cloud that comes from the gluonic fields, and basically uh, you're looking at conversion of C quarks and gluons into each other. So what, the way to look at this diagram is to, x equal to 0.3 means each parton is taking 30% of the proton's momentum. x equal to 0.5 means it is taking 0.5 x equal to 1 means that part on that you just looked at carried all the information about the momentum. It's, that's all there is then. That's the property of the quark taking all the proton's momentum. Never happens because you can't do that. It's just imp uh, improbable. But when you go to the other direction, then you start creating these pion clouds inside the proton, or these gluon clouds, that then go into quark-antiquark -quark pair, and you start creating this picture. To resolve, to really see if that is really happening, we need to understand this. And what we expect to see is that 
Since we are not putting in an asymmetry, there shouldn't be an asymmetry. Q Q bar pair C quartz generated at smallish x are predicted to be unpolarized. The gluons generated from C quark also expected to be unpolarized. But we need those high precision images. And one thing that I have not mentioned is what happens to a nucleus when you look at it a transverse direction, coming at you with very high velocity. If you were able to look at the nucleus separated as quark and gluon fields coming at you, what would you see? We don't know that quite yet. How would you, how would you characterize that? And that's the experiment that is being done at RIC and LHC. And the transverse dimension is important, as people here could vouch for. So that's really a high potential for whenever QCD doesn't predict it, we get always surprised. So this is something that we will now look at another experiment at low energy and high energy. So here's my fixed target proton, three quarks, dominant valence quarks, lots of other things. And this is my time axis. So there are these uh, excitations, gluon excitations going, and time is flowing this way. The quarks are here. And I make an experimental measurement, which is shown by the blue line here, blue box. That's my measurement. That's window. So if I ask you, what does the proton look like? It will look like three quarks and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten gluons. That would be my answer after the experiment of a stationary proton. Now what happens when you do this experiment at the regime of the collider? And here's my assumption that you know, collider is indicated by high velocity, so I'm just boosting it. Now what happens? Now the parton fluctuation that I just mentioned to you are time dilated in the strong interaction time scale. So they live longer in that time scale. Long-lived gluons radiate further small x gluons because each gluon is now able to radiate another glue, and that glue will be another, another two gluons, and this whole thing can just go on because they're colored. And if that happens, then you expect a runaway growth. Well, if you look at Wilczek's Nobel lecture, he actually says that. The result is a self-catalyzed enhancement that leads to a runaway growth. A small color charge in isolation builds a big thundercloud in nature that doesn't happen because the energy inside the proton is finite. So every time the new gluons are created, they're created at lower and lower energies, total momentum being conserved, total energy is conserved. So there is a growth no matter what. The number of gluons increases, however, the energy does. So it doesn't grow into a, it's a thundercloud. This is an isolated color chart that he's talking about. Inside the proton, something new happens. And that's something that we are going to explore. So here is that happening in place. This is the gluon distribution increasing. This is a measurement coming from the Hera collider. Here is my X. Here is the parton distributions of other kind. And here is your glue. And that gluon number is increasing because every time there's a chance this glue splits into a two gluons, this two will then split more and keep on going. This whole thing keeps on going. That infinite rise is something that we physicists don't like. So something has to happen. At some point, the gluon density has to be so high that something new has to happen to make sure that all the cross sections that we see in nature, all the structures that you see in nature are finite. And what that is, is beautiful, that comes naturally from QCD itself. You are in a room of huge number of gluons. Now, at extremely high density here, it started growing, but the chances that another glue, one glue meets another glue to do the reverse interaction also grows because you're increasing the number of gluons in a finite volume. So this diagram called recombination also grows as you go from here to there. At some point, at the energy in the x-axis here, the two will become equal. As they become equal, you should see a change in the slope of the gluons. The gluon numbers do not change beyond that point. At that point, it forms a gluonic object. Every nucleon that you see in nature, every nucleus that you will see in nature, should form a gluonic object of extremely interesting properties. There is no place to grow beyond what is there. Huge number of gluons, and there are basically no quarks. It's a purely gluonic object. And theorists have now calculated the properties of that and have called it the color glass condensate. The color, because it comes from the color interactions, 
condensate because it comes from large number of spin one objects called we, we call gluons and glassy because the interactions that they expect to see are over the entire volume of the nucleon or the nucleus collective behavior collective behavior of gluons okay so that's the reason why why they have called it but we have not seen it unambiguously in nature so this is something that we are going after as a new phase now let me come to some of the experimental aspects of the talk so there are currently two options of realization. One uses the RIC collider. The blue ring here and the yellow ring here exist. They are operational. We are doing experiments on it for the last 15, 17 years. And the proposal is to add the electron beam facility, as shown here by red, inside the same tunnel and have it collide with the experimental areas, with the experiments, in two different locations. That's why we call it E. Rick. On the other side, we have a Jefferson Lab 12 GV upgraded CBAF facility. We would then extract the electron beam and put it into this bow tie shaped collider and have two collision points here. The bow tie shape comes from the fact that the space available on the site is not large enough, but still you need to have some accelerator issues solved. So there's a very clever uh, idea that came from one of the accelerator physicists that uh, allows us to do this and there's a question at the end in accelerator science I will come back to it and tell you why that is the case but anyway the two collider plans are, are about to achieve the same science that we put as users and prospective future scientists to the physics that I've just described to you so here is the white paper that we set we will have polarized electron proton deuteron or helium beams We'll have electron beams from 5 to 10 GeV, maybe even 20 GeV. The luminosity is going to be 10 to the 33 to 34 centimeters square per second. That's about 100 to 1,000 times that of Hera. And a variable center of mass that allows us to go to different centers of mass and change the energy of the collision and also various large range in nuclei. Um, it, when built, it will be the first polarized electron proton or electron light ion collider as well as the electron nucleus collider. And both designs use significant infrastructure investments from US De Department of Energy's uh, point of view. What does it buy us? Well, the low X part. This is the X, the same X that I was talking to you about before, the fractional momentum carried by the partons, and the Q squared, which is the resolution scale. How resolved is the proton? The larger the Q squared, the smaller the lambda, so you can resolve it better. Remember that? early equation I wrote. So you want to see a proton at different resolution scales. You want to resolve what happens to quarks and gluons as you look at it from a different femtoscope, yeah? How magnification, and that's on this one. And you get that in two orders of magnitude better than anything in the past experiments have achieved. Similarly for neutron the nuclei, here are the past experiments, and we will extend these, quark, these ranges of low x as well as high q squared very, very significantly. So that uh, sort of summarizes the science that I've just mentioned to you. The parton density, 1 over, is increasing in this direction. That's 1 over x. Then the perturbative QCD or the non-perturbative QCD comes in because of the resolution scale. We know very well what happens at very high resolution. When the resolution scale is very small, you know what is happening because Hera has done it. LHC is now doing it, physics, yeah? So we know what happens at the partonic level. What we don't know is what happens in the middle here. And these are the parts that we want to go slowly and study it with various different variables. So I mentioned to you the spin sum rule. Here is an example of how well this measurement will happen. Here is the gluon distribution as we know it today. The data stops around here and around the place where the gluon distributions increase in their uncertainty. Because we are going to the low x, to the 10 to the minus 4, this is the part that gets reduced to this red band here. Another way of looking at this part is that the quark's contribution to the nucleon spin compared to the gluon's contribution, which is currently at this level of three sigma uncertainty, starts going down to either the red or the yellow, depending on what energy we run this machine at, 5 on 250 or 220 on uh, 250. And clearly, we'll start getting into comparable zones where uncertainty is from lattice QCD and the experiments can actually be first fully checked for nucleon spin. 
But I promise you more than that. I promised you that I will get a three-dimensional picture, the image of the proton. And here is my example. This is my 1D per, uh, uh, image of something that you probably can recognize. And I really want to reconstruct this. I really don't want to have that. So we are really going to go from this one-dimensional picture to the full-scale picture of that. So how do we do that? So in the last 15 to 20 years, a theoretical framework has evolved in nuclear science, which was known to atomic physicists for a long time. Wigner functions, which are functions of x, the fractional momentum that I've been talking about. Bt is the transverse distance of the proton, of the parton inside the proton. And kt is its transverse motion. And here is a three-dimensional okay, picture of that. And that's what I want to know. I want to know what is kt, transverse momentum. What is bt, how far is it from the center? And what's the momentum it is carrying? The momentum fraction, the, the function, which is called a 3D momentum, transverse momentum distributions, have now been measured through the experiments that I mentioned to you before. Look at kaons going to the left, right, and looking at them, we have been, we have been looking at it in a high resolution to see what fraction, how much momentum do they carry. We can, we can get to that through these kind of measurements. But then there is another way to get to the spatial contribution. I will come back to this. But they're called generalized parton distribution functions. You integrate over kt, and what remains is the impact parameter. The impact parameter, when you look at it certain spaces, uh, you start getting what is called a GPDs. And both together start giving you position and momentum distributions that all eventually will lead to the orbital motion. And how that happens, I will come back to that a little later. So here is my explanation of the GPDs, which tells you the position distribution here. Now, I told you that I want to measure the orbital motion of quarks and gluons inside the proton. Until now, I was doing deep inelastic scattering. I was breaking the proton every time I was hitting it with my probe. If I have a bowl of glass bowl of water and three ping pong balls, and if I want to see the motion of these ping pong balls inside with the glass, I would not use a baseball bat to hit the ball, hit the, uh, the glass bowl, because as soon as I hit it, the whole thing breaks out. I lose the information about the motion. So you need to do something else. You need to have a paddle slowly without breaking the glass. You have to go in and see the pressures that you feel by the motion of the guar on your sensitive paddles of the quarks, as well as, in this case, ping pong balls and, and the gluons. That's what you want to do. So basically, you want to do a non-violent collision of electron, because that's the precision I have in control, and a non-violent collision from a person who has grown up in India, it's a Gandhian collision. So I, put in, so it's, I call them Gandhian collisions. It's deeply virtual Compton scattering, and I'll come back to it as to what it is. So here is my, what happens. Here's the electron comes through, scatters, and here's my virtual photon, converts into quark antiquark pair. The proton is the whole thing inside. This is the quark from the proton it picks up. Antiquark is here. It radiates a real photon and then jumps back, and the proton is remaining intact. This was discovered in 1996 to 9, 2001 at HERA in Zeus and H1, the two experiments that we were, we were, we were on. I think H1 realized it first. Uh, we were a little late in realizing what we were seeing, but you guys were faster. But here is the process. Electron goes to, and proton goes to E prime, P prime, and gamma. I need a real photon in my detector. I need to tag the proton that is unbroken, which was the most difficult thing because it remains close to the beam pipe and very difficult to detect. But in the future, we want to do it. Similarly, if the interaction is initiated by a gluon like this, then the same process results in a vector boson. And then you can get information about what happened to the gluon. So basically, these are the two final states which are novel that have people realized will carry information about transverse motion and the rotational motion, possible rotational motion of quarks and gluons. And those are the ones that theorists have now analyzed and tell us that we can get information about the orbital motion. You have to measure everything here. So that's the exclusive measurement. Because you need to have the proton going so close to the pin pipe, and you need to still measure it very clearly. So that's really the, the, the difficult part in the measurement. If you actually do this, then you start creating this MRI-like images of protons. This is the U-quarks image in some simulation, of course, in the KY versus KX direction, momentum distributions of a polarized proton. This is a D-quark distribution looking at the pi minuses. This is looking at the pi pluses. 
This is looking at the pi minuses. And knowing this magnetic measurement over a wide range in x, which is shown here, you can make measurements, direct measurements of these kind of parton distribution functions, which are now called Sivers functions, transverse momentum distributions as a function of momentum fractions. So that's something that has never happened. We don't know how they evolve. The evolution itself has a huge amount of QCD information that, that Ralston et al. predicted in the 30 years ago. On the right hand side is a similar thing now. It's, it's a distribution of position. This is BT, transverse momentum, BX versus BY, of the gluonic distribution in unpolarized proton and a polarized proton from the C quarks. And again, you can start making profile functions at different energies, different resolutions of the proton. How would these gluon distribution grow in terms of their momentum? This is what we know. This is the growth that is shown by the gluon rising. But what is interesting is that we are able to resolve the endpoints very, very, very clearly. And that's the critical part to know what is the gluon distribution of a transverse proton coming at you at high energy. And that's something that we can resolve very directly now through these formalisms that have been developed. So the summary of what I've said so far is, is something that you, you can, I, I can explain to you in a very different way. Suppose you wanted to know the internal structure of a watermelon. How would you do the experiment? The first experiment you would do is this. You would just take the watermelons and bang them against each other. That's what we have been doing so far at Hera, at, at, at LHC and RIC. Proton, proton, boom, what falls out. And you will be able to tell me what's inside, the meat and the seeds, et cetera, et cetera. But if I tell you what was the distribution of the seeds, you won't be able to tell me that from that experiment. For that, you need a knife. And here is our experimenter using a knife. Knife is an unbreakable thing that collides with a watermelon, and you're cutting it with control. A knife is the electron. That's the unbreakable part. OK? Now, if I tell you the watermelon is alive, I want to see the motion of those seeds inside. Of course, that's a hypothetical thing. And then what you would want to do is to take an MRI without breaking the, because once you break the, you know, even you cut it, you die, you kill the watermelon. I don't know why, but you can find MRI of a watermelon on the internet. I don't know why, but this is what we want to do. Okay, this is really what we want to do. Because we believe those seeds are moving inside the proton, and we better see them when we see that, that motion. And that's, that's the three-dimensional picture of the MRI of the proton. Now briefly, let me comment on the nuclei <coughs> and the laboratory for QCD. First and foremost, a simple thing that has never been done is that you have a photon coming through. This is the electron and the photon, uh, electron scattered, emits the photon, hits the parton inside a proton inside a nucleus. A collider gives you a huge amount of control over how much energy you have in this incoming photon because you have an energy range that is available, wide range. Then you say, aha, I can look at light versus heavy quarks, but the quark hits, and then it starts moving in the cold QCD medium. Cold QCD medium that we call nucleus. And at some point, it comes out. When it comes out, it forms a pion, picks up an anti-quark from somewhere, and comes out a pion. That's a simple process that has been, that we think we understand, but we don't. We have never done this experiment. The theorists cannot tell us exactly what happens inside the Q cold QCD medium. And here is a controlled experiment in which you can size, you can change the, the Q, the, the energy of this photon. You can change the size of the nucleus to make it go through small or large amount of cold QCD matter. There are very puzzling aspects in hot QCD matter called the quark gluon plasma that LHC and Rick folks are now puzzling with. And that's shown here, referred to that, when a hot QCD matter, within the hot QCD matter, when a quark passes through it, you expect, because it has fluid properties, you expect something that will happen like this. You have a water flowing, and to measure the fluidity of that water, you throw stones or pebbles in there. And the lighter the stone, the more easily it will flow. The heavier the stone, it will not. Yes? That's the simple explanation of what people thought would happen. You look at the flow of heavy quarks inside the quark-gluon plasma versus light quarks. 
and heavy quartz are some heavy particles coming out of charm or bottom uh, quartz and light quartz or pions. And they found to their surprise that no matter what experiment you do with heavy quartz, either you do it at 200 GeV at, at RIC, at 60 GeV at RIC, or 2.7 TeV at LHC, they don't see any difference. There is no difference in the flow characteristic of heavy versus light quartz. Why does that happen? They all ask questions about that. They see what was the initial state of the nucleus before it collided. We don't know the initial state of the nucleus as well as we want to know as people start doing these calculations. And that's where the EIC comes into picture. We will tell you what the with high precision what the initial state of the nucleus was just before it collided. And it's all connected to the gluons. So here is what the parton distribution functions look like today in the gluon structure function. Large uncertainties are shown. And a simple measurement, a day one measurement of EIC will reduce those uncertainties from this to somewhere in the blue regime and finally to the red regime here. So there's a huge drastic improvement that you can start getting. And last but not the least, I mentioned to you this growth and why it is happening, one over the energy resolution scale. We are going in that direction as you go to higher energy. There's some saturation. At what point does it happen is not known. We think we understand that it should happen because of this process. And if it happens, is it a collective phenomena that has been predicted? We want to know whether it is universal. That means, does it happen in light nuclei high at high enough energy? And does it happen at with uranium nuclei at slightly lower energy? Because all I'm changing is the number of partons that are in, in there. So does it happen in proton as well? There's a beautiful paper by T.D. Lee and uh, Al Mueller in 1979 that argues that the proton and the nucleus of very heavy nucleus lead should look identical at high energy. Very intuitively correct. Why should the parton know whether it is a part of the proton or the nucleus? Very simple. But we have never tested that. And this paper, this idea, this idea can be really tested. Now, you might ask, well, Hera tried to measure it. Why won't you, why would a collider, half the energy would do that? Well, the trick is to get to nuclei. And how does nuclei work? Here's the nucleus boosted. And then I'm exploring it with a parton, with a, with a photon, electron emitted photon like this. Collectively, all these partons are being probed, not a single parton. Remember, the resolution I want is approximately the size, a little less than the proton or the nuclear size. If I go to an extremely high energy, the lambda goes down. The Q squared is very large. Lambda goes down. I'm looking at partonic structure. I don't want to see the substructure of the quark, which I would need to go if I have to go to TeV energy. But here, I don't need it. I want the collective behavior of the partons. So I don't need the energy, but I do need a large number of nuclei because I want to change them and do the experiment again and again. And the reason is that a to the power 1 third by x is how this scale changes, is simple calculation will tell you. And what that means is a gluon a picture that looks in proton like this, this is q squared, this is x, it goes up as a function of a, a to the power 1 third, or 10 to the minus 5 looks like 10 to the minus 3. All I'm trying to do is to not to go to high energy, but high parton density. Why not use a nucleus, which is a lot of partons already in there, and then compress them and look at them collectively. The only reason I wanted to go to high energy was I was going to create the large number of partons by going to very high energy. The gluon grows like that. Here, I don't need to do that. I just use nuclei instead. God packed the nucleons very well inside the nucleus. I'm going to use them to study this physics. And then a nice picture, a three-dimensional picture emerges. Here is my parton distribution function. This is the atomic nuclei. And these are our current estimates of what it might look like in the saturation scale. And I would like to go experimentally and measure all these things in the range, in the various ranges of A, in various ranges of X, and see that these predictions and this science is correct. Because this comes out of perturbative fusidity as we know it today. It has to be right, but we've never seen it. So QS is enhancement saturation regime coming at a lower cost. I don't want to create another new collider. I have things that exist. I'm going to use them by using the nuclei. So this is, this is something that, uh, and how do we measure it? Let me quickly go through some of the experimental uh, significant uh, measurements. Here is a diffraction. This is optics. And you have a disk, and you shine monochromatic light on it, 
and you see diffractive patterns, and that's what is shown here. And you know how to analyze them. These are kinematics things that you learn in interaction. <coughs> now, I told you this gluonic object that I'm going to create is going to be extremely dense. So if I'm able to shine light on it, I should start seeing things that are akin to diffraction. Like this. This is the kind of calculation of what we should see. This is the incoherent where the nucleus breaks up, and this is the part which I'm looking at. And this is very small. This is two orders of magnitude small than normally what you see. You have a nucleus, and I'm hitting it with the nuclear. Diffraction is difficult to see, and we saw that at HERA. Here's the picture. At HERA, we had 327 GeV electron hitting a 900 GeV proton. And to our surprise, 10 to 15 percent of the time, proton did not break. That's like a TeV electron hitting a stationary proton, and 15 percent of the time, the proton does not break. What would it do? Why would it happen? Nobody could really explain that. But we understood that the diffractive cross-section, which QED predicted to be less than 1 percent at that time, or QCD, was not that small. It was 100 times more, or 50, 50 times more than what we had estimated before. The same idea is, if you do this on a nucleus, now predict that 30 to 40 percent of the time, the nucleus will not break. Can you imagine a 1 TeV electron hitting a nucleus, and 30 percent of the time, the nucleus is bound by MeV energy, in some cases KeV energy. And the prediction of this theory is that if this idea, this color glass condensate, this gluonic object is true, then it will form such a high density gluonic matter that it will look like an opaque object to that light that I'm shining through that electron scattering experiment, photon coming through. That photon acts as the monochromatic light. My nucleus acts at that opaque disk, and I see the diffractive patterns. It's going to be a sensitive, sensitive measurement, but we think we can do it. We have done these simulations, production of Jopsi, Rho, uh, and we can see that this is a particular one for row production, I believe. And you can see that this, this is something that we can resolve again. There are experimental issues that we need to, um, we need to uh, resolve. And I think the experimental measurement uh, 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 expertise is, is in this group here. I think I'm hoping that they get involved much more directly and really tell us how to make that measurement. But if that is true, then we really see in that diffractive pattern without saturation or with saturation, you'll see a one cross-section for E gold over EP ratio, and with, without saturation, where this thing doesn't, it's all nonsense, it doesn't happen for some reason, then you'll see a very, very different uh, a ratio of the E gold over EP in the diffractive part. So try to summarize all these things in one slide. How does the nucleon come about? What is the various things we can study the nuclei? And what happens in the extremely high energy? So those are the three pillars around which the science has been promoted and proposed and, and defended. Those are completely unique things that no other things can do. However, we know also know from HERA and us such colliders at RIC, uh, at LHC, that a collider never really uh, confines itself to the physics that we planned for. The most important things come out of it that after we do that, we realize that the important thing came from somewhere else. So we are optimistic that there are already new ideas emerging with JET's physics at LHC compared to RIC compared to the EIC in the future. There are very nice, beautiful ideas emerging. Anything that you can think of coming into that would be welcome. And this is something that we are now looking at the realization. So it's very unique. Here are all the experiments ever done in deep inelastic scattering with polarized beams or unpolarized beams or targets of different kinds. And here is what we are planning to do. Here is the center of mass energy and the luminosity. High is not good enough for us. We don't want to see the quark substructure. This is where we'll see the quark substructure. This is where we'll see the spin, et cetera, et cetera. So if you ask uh, the, these facilities, how many of them have high luminosity and a wide center of mass reach, change in the center of mass energy is very difficult for most colliders. Rick does it very, very efficiently because it was designed that way. In this EIC of the future, we want to keep that possibility, and that's why we have. Then we ask for how many of them have polarized lepton beams or nuclear beams, and suddenly you see that the whole landscape is, is, is very empty. So it's really rather 
unique machine that we are, we are planning, to, we're planning to build. Here is a summary of center of mass energy and the science that we want to do as a function of luminosity. Nuclei, study of nuclei, extreme parton density, saturation, then the spin structure and the transfer momentum distribution. This goes in the larger and larger luminosity regime. Can be done about one year to about 10 years is what we are thinking this, this program can be developed. We have formed a user group. We really, really need you to get involved. We have currently about 750, I'll come back to that. We have uh, started meetings uh, regularly starting at Stony Brook in 2014. Then we moved to Berkeley next year and then Argonne after the long range plan. And then we had two more meetings recently in first one in Europe and the next one is now coming. Uh, is uh, this weekend is a detector planning and design meeting at Temple University and uh, there's going to be a meeting, a summer meeting in Catholic American University, Washington DC. There are lots of opportunities and contribution participation. So please look at this and jump in. Here is the current distribution of what the users group look like. About 46% are North Americans, 20% Asians, 30% Europeans and then there are smaller groups from Africa, South America. And, and Australia. So you can see that there's a large and varied interest uh, from institutions all around the world, which really gives us the hope that this is all going to work out. We are expecting that this number will eventually grow. By the time we construct, we are looking for two collider detectors. My expectation is that each one of them will have about 800 to 1,000 people by the time we actually realize it. So this has the potential to grow. These 720 actually, as of this morning, is 752. Um, this, this number does not have graduate students in them yet because we think that 10 years is too long a time to keep track of uh, graduate students, so we don't have them. Neither do we have postdocs. So these are faculty positions and scientists who have shown interest in actually pursuing that. So what do we want to build in detector? So I guess this is something that I will skip very quickly. Basically, proton, uh, proton and electron scatter, and generally what we see in a Pythia simulation, for example, is like this, the particle multiplicities, etc. Not as daunting as RIC or LHCR, not LH anything close to that. So we know exactly how to build these detectors. Um, we need to look at the electron side, which is a very high, high intensity electron beam. And four detector concepts have evolved. These two are dedicated to the Phoenix interaction regions. These are Phoenix uh, at Brookhaven, and this is an uh, independent, uh, uh, what they call BEAST, Brookhaven's Electron IA. Uh, solenoid or tracker. Uh, again, this is an ideal detector that you would build if you had no constraint. This is something we start with the S Phoenix detector, which is being built now, which is the central arm. And then I propose to add a forward arm and a backward arm for hadron and electron and see what we can do. There is a third idea coming from Jefferson Lab, it looks very similar to the Beast detector, not surprisingly, but uh, this is a, a group that is working from Jefferson Lab and basically. Uh, uh, the functionality is, is very identical. And a new group from Argonne has proposed uh, a detector that is uh, based on the particle flow idea coming from high energy physics, a uh, purely silicon detector uh, 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 field, and comes uh, directly from the ILC, basically. That's the idea that comes through. So penultimate slide, a pass forward. Uh, I may have alluded to, we are being reviewed by the National Academy of Sciences. Any project that starts reaching 750 million to a billion dollars has to go through this process these days. We are now, we expected that. We are expecting a result from them. In fact, they're meeting today and tomorrow for the pre-penalty or penultimate meeting, as they call, they call it. And they're writing a report. Uh, I have no worries about it. From what I've seen, the questions that they posed us after our science presentation, it all looks good. So we are expecting a positive result in 2018, around March or April. Once that happens, the DOE has said that they will start the CD process, which means that we want to get a CD zero sometime in the next calendar year during our early to FY19. And then the proposals will be uh, evaluated for cost and technical review sometime in the FY20 time. And currently, the major construction funds are expected to flow around 22, 23. This is in the long range plan that has been looked at, at uh, in the long range discussion. Now, it may go a little bit further because of the realities of this year versus last year, but I think we are really strapped for time in terms of what happens to the money that is available for construction in the nuclear science division. Once FRIP gets constructed, that 120 to $150 million 
a year. If that's not being used, as you know, DOE likes to get that money out from our budgets. If you didn't use it this year, they think you don't need it, they will take it away. This is the concern nuclear physics office has. So they are really pushing us hard to make the design concepts clear as, as soon as possible, including the detector. So that is what is, is pushing us to move faster. That's really what a DOE is asking us to do. To get ready for a CD3, which is start of construction by 22-23. That means that the detector and the accelerator design have to be finalized at least a year before. So this is what we are, we are chasing. In summary, I believe that the IC with its precision and control will profoundly impact our understanding of many body structures and nucleons and nuclei in terms of quarks and gluons. It really wants to build that bridge between C quarks and gluons to nuclei. It will enable images of yet unexplored regions of QCD phase space with its high luminosity and energy. That itself gives us high potential for discovery. Outstanding questions that are being raised by current experiments and theories at CERN, Brookhaven, Jefferson Lab have, have led us to these science. And that's the reason why you see there is a broad interest in the science community around the world. And the accelerator scientists whose contribution I cannot, cannot overemphasize is really critical. And they are actually working with uh, uh, experts from outside to really make this uh, accelerator frontier facility possible. NSAC has funded this, or at least approved this, not funded this. Um, uh, we, we are glad to go forward uh, with the accelerated timeline that we are now being forced to put in. Thank you very much. So at Q squared of 1, that's my, in my mind, is the demarcation. It's not real, but demarcation between perturbative and non-perturbative QCD. At 100 GeV, it's 10 to the minus 4 in X. At Q squared of 1, 10 to the minus 4, Q squared, uh, a center of mass energy of 100. In some of the designs that I'm telling you, we can go to about 140, which improves this to about 5, 10 to the minus 5. That's still less than what we saw at Hera. Yeah, but it's very different. I mean, a, a, this landscape is extremely different. We, we want to do this with the nuclei. We want to do it with polarized proton. We didn't have them, so it's a different thing. I'm just thinking that's linear in the Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Do you expect the uncertainties, you said for the, the, the gluons, you, you had uncertainty of 100% in terms of the spin contribution over the next decade, which is going to take for this, do you expect There's no other experiment that even addresses it closely. We have tried very hard to go beyond the current level of that number. I mean, what I showed you is including the 15 years of rig data that we have. So the global analysis allows us to get to at the most 20%, you know, 25 plus minus 20 in some optimistic scenarios, but that's debatable. Everyone agrees there is a hundred percent uncertainty in the total gluon spin com contribution. That's everyone is comfortable with that statement. A small fraction of people are more ambitious in agreeing to a certain those lower estimates of uncertainty, but they too will give you twenty instead of twenty-five. So there is really nothing coming up. I mean, this was planned um, at Hera. I would have liked to get it done in two thousand two. Had they allowed me to do polarize these this polarized protons at HERA, we would have done this program in 2002 for $30 million. That's what I was asking at that time. Now it's a billion dollars. So. And I was told it was too small. These are the words of the director. I was told it was too small an amount for, me to, for, for them to invest in for four years of operation. But basically, those polarized protons were the critical thing for that, pro, that, that program. It couldn't happen. Siberian snake magnets, those are the ones that are crucial. So those are, I wanted six of them. It takes $5 million. We have them up from the Riken Center. We built them for Rick. We built eight of them. Uh, and so that, that is what was experimental. We were talking about RBRC this afternoon. This is what the Riken provided money for. So thank you very much. Mike. All right, thank you.